Our speaker today is Dr. Noel McGurk. He is a lecturer in law at Lancaster University in the UK and specializes in international terrorism and the law. Noel is a senior fellow at Advance HE UK. Previously, Noel was a judicial research assistant at the Court of Appeal in Ireland, where he worked on a range of different projects and cases. Noel is interested in the development of legal responses aimed at managing the threat posed by terrorism. Terrorist Profiling in Law Enforcement is Noel's first monograph, so congratulations, Noel, and of course, the subject of today's author's talk. So a big warm welcome to Noel, and thank you for joining us and making time to uh, tell us a bit more about your book and your research. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for everybody who is coming to listen as well. So I'm just going to share uh, the PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll get started, if that's okay. Brilliant. Perfect. Uh, so, hopefully that's showing okay. So, the book that we're looking at today, as indicated, is the Terrorist Profiling and Law Enforcement. And in this uh, piece of research, I'm really focusing on answering three simple questions. And in essence, the, the overarching aim of the book is, is to examine the circumstances in which law enforcement officers or police officers are able to rely on profiling methods and approaches. But in order to answer that question, I, I think there are three separate questions that needs to be answered. The first one is, well, well, what is terrorist profiling? Whenever we talk about profiling generally, we all have a, an understanding from our own experiences as to what terrorist profiling might mean. Uh, however, I would challenge anyone whenever they're coming to the study of profiling that uh, there is a, a greater need for a systematic process to understand what it is uh, if, as the precursor uh, to uh, making determinations about its usefulness. So once we understand what it is, I think then the second question we have to address and what I address in the book is how should the usefulness of terrorist profiling be examined? So. I, you probably would have read literature before on various examples of profiling. So what I seek to develop in the book and in previous research is a methodology that can allow for a basis to engage in assessing and measuring the usefulness of profiling. It's not a perfect system, and I don't think there are few systems in law that are, but it's at least a starting point to begin a conversation about how do we measure and how do we make determinations in a much more systematic process. And then the last one is, is the thorny question of can terrorist profiling ever be considered a useful counterterrorism tool? So, so the, 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 there, there is a need to, to make a determination on various examples and manifestations of terrorist profiling. And in order to do that, we have to have, and I would argue, a systematic process for doing that. Now, I would acknowledge that there has lots of previous works on this area, and what my book adopts is a slightly different approach in the sense that much of the previous literature has tended to focus on examples of profiling that would be considered pejorative or examples of pure, poor practice of profiling. And what, what I would argue is that in order to understand what it is and how it should be examined, we need to take a more objective and a much more systematic approach to, to uh, assessing it. And of course, you may be wondering why terrorist profiling? Well, the broader context of this is that over the last few decades, international law and domestic law has uh, progressively moved towards using uh, law as a tool, a tool to allow for risk to be calculated and managed in the context of terrorism. And therefore, uh, this book focuses on just one policy response, one policing power as a means to uh, assess what it is and can it be used, considered useful. And it's often this difficult balance, whenever we're answering these questions, between a state's obligation to protect against the risk and threat posed by terrorism, against the context of being, having to uphold our obligations towards fundamental human rights and freedoms. And often they, they, this, this, is, this is an uneasy tension. And I think the more systematic we adopt approaches to assessing these controversial policies, the, the stronger, more robust conclusions that we can draw. 
Okay, so there we are with our three questions at, as, the, as, a, as a context. Our, our first question, well, what is terrorist profile? I'm sure we're all able to think about examples of profilings, maybe stuff we've read in the news, in the media, uh, over the last two decades about profiling. But in general, there is a complete lack of consensus as to what constitutes profiling, never mind terrorist profiling. And there are approaches that adopt wide definitions and there are others that adopt narrow. I, I argue in the book that profiling has to be considered as being a process that allows a profiler to identify commonalities from different sets of data. If you think about what profiling is, it's about allowing, in this case, a law enforcement officer to make determinations about data that they have in, in respect of their subject or the profile that they're seeking to build, that the ultimate aim is to predict likely offender or terrorist characteristics. So in thinking about that, there is synonymous labels that have emerged in the media and in the academic literature about different examples of uh, profiling and that they're the ones that we tend to know more about. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that these forms of profiling are acceptable or necessarily advocating for the use of terrorist profiling or any profiling. It, it's more about this, the process we use to make determinations about different manifestations. How do we arrive at a more objective assessment in order to make more robust conclusions about their likely uh, usefulness? And there are various terms that like ethnic profiling racial profiling and religious profiling. So in the literature, whenever we're trying to discover what is terrorist profiling, often it's overshadowed by examples or manifestations that are clearly unlawful and show poor practice in the part of police officers. The, the problem then that this creates in trying to adopt that more objective approach is that it, it, it overshadows, well, what is actually profiling whenever we, we try to, to pair it back and distill some of the core characteristics in order to understand and make judgments about these different types that we might have. And what I would argue is that you might say, well, what is in an aim? What, what is uh, so significant if we have poor examples? Why do we not call it racial profiling or is it appropriate in religious profiling or, or, or a racial or ethnic profiling. And I, I argue is that the problem with the focal and the focus in the literature on this is that it's quite a pejorative term to classify, as I said, police conduct that unjustifiably relies on sensitive characteristics. So these are clearly examples that are, that are never going to be uh, considered appropriate. So therefore the conclusions that they draw on these types in the literature on the, these types of profiling are almost self-serving where that these examples uh, are held up as being uh, poor practice or unlawful. The problem with that approach is that we don't always understand well at what point in the profiling process uh, does uh, these uses of profiling become unlawful or trying to understand the why as opposed to uh, reaching or drawing the conclusions. And often that in these poor examples that uh, you see in the literature that they, they focus on is that it's because these examples tend to centre around the use or over-reliance on what I refer to as sensitive characteristics, the characteristics that tend to point to certain racial, ethnic or religious minorities. Well, then the next question you might be wondering, well, what, what is it that I'm proposing and how should profiling be actually understood? And I say that, that in order to make a more systematic understanding of the profiling process, I say that you've got to say and acknowledge that any sort of profiling, whether it might be considered, if there is, and I'm not suggesting there is any good ones, but even if there were good ones, that, well, what, what is, that, is that, that, or what is the poor examples? Well, they're all processes that are seeking to allow the profiler to identify, as I say, these sequence of commonalities from different sets of data so as to predict, to make that prediction about likely uh, offender uh, characteristics. The, the problem um, with uh, adopting uh, a, a more narrow, as you see, that's quite a wide de a definition, is that if you adopt a narrow 
a definition of profiling, it tends not to be able to capture maybe those examples of profiling that we might consider to be uh, outside the scope of it. So that's why I would advocate that whenever we understand or seek and set out what we understand by, by profiling, we should adopt a broad approach to capture the most, the most possible. So in essence, what I'm saying really is that the use of any data, so any source data where a profiler is seeking to make predictions about likely offender characteristics can be considered some form of profiling. It may be criminal investigation, it may be an apprehension, or it may even be a prosecution of offenders. So in, in, in assessing and in summary, uh, they are a wide process, any approach. It doesn't have to be a method, it could be any approach or technique where the law enforcement officer or the profiler is essentially seeking to identify those likely offender characteristics. So the next question then becomes, uh, well, what are the different forms of profiling? How would we begin to make distinctions between different types of profiling? If we're thinking about a process, and viewing this as being a process. Well, within that process, how do we start to make distinctions in order to adopt a much more systematic process to understanding all forms of profiling? And remember, the purpose of this is to make determinations about its usefulness. So at this stage, we're still trying to understand what is terrorist profiling, and we're still not quite there yet, uh, but we can begin to see that at this stage, we're thinking of profiling as being a process, and that process is primarily about making uh, distinctions in order to see what the commonalities are. So what are the different forms then? How do we classify a terrorist profiling? Well, there are two broad types that, that are, exist, and the importance of these will come apparent in a moment. The first type is deductive. Uh, and this is where the law enforcement officer or the police officer is using a profiling method to react to crimes uh, that's been committed. So uh, this would be um, where certain crimes have maybe a pathology, such as maybe murder or arson, where the police officer can go out to the crime scene and look through and try to discern, well, how did this offence happen in order to make predictions about, well, who would the likely offender be? So. Uh, the key the key essence or difficulty or challenge from a terrorism perspective of this is that offenders have to exhibit particular pathologies in their commission of crime. So, so I argue that this type of profiling would never be really appropriate or suitable for terrorist profiling for a number of reasons. And two in particular is the fact that, that these types of crimes, in order to try to understand the pathology, you need to have an, a, a range of offences that occur on a frequent basis or semi-frequent basis. And as terrorism in of itself is a relatively infrequent occurrent, occurrence, um, this would mean that th th there isn't enough data in order to try to understand the pathology. The second thing, of course, is that modern examples of terrorism have tended to be uh, where either there's been a complete destruction of the crime scene because of the, the, the actual attack, or that the, there is no suspect because the suspect has committed, uh, uh, has conducted a, a suicide attack. And that creates a difficulty because if you think about what deductive profiling is, it's where the, the police officer is essentially seeking to try to discern characteristics from crime scene evidence or victim reports. And they're not, may not, they may not be as, as fulsome in, in contrast to other crimes that has pathologies. So in thinking about and understanding what is terrorist profiling, we can say that this type of profiling probably wouldn't be so suitable for terrorist profiling, therefore we, we, any type of profiling that we would uh, classify as deductive would not really be suitable for terrorism. The second type is inductive. So this is where the law enforcement officer, the police officer is essentially relying on proactive profiling methodologies as a tool to predict likely offender uh, characteristics. So almost the, the police officer is looking into the crystal ball by using a range of different data in order to predict future uh, offending characteristics. Um, now, I argue in the book that I, I don't come out conclusively and say that inductive profiling is suitable. What, what, what I suggest is that it may be suitable and I identify that there are four conditions that need to be satisfied in order for this type of profiling that it could be suitable. 
what I would argue is that there, the first thing that, that any profiler would have to be a have to have knowledge of and be uh, on a heightened alert for is that the availability of terrorism and information and data is scant and the sharing of that between different jurisdictions is limited. So whenever the profiler might be constructing this profile, that you might be thinking uh, that there isn't enough availability of raw data. There is also the changing nature of information on terrorists, that there is often a difficulty that ter terrorism by its very nature is, uh, is in a continual state of flux and different iterations of, of how acts are perpetrated change significantly over time and therefore any predictions based on something that was penned 15 years ago is probably going to be out of date today. The, the, the third thing is that the, the accuracy of available data, how different countries, given that terrorism is international, how, how countries collect and record information is vastly different and therefore the accuracy of available data May, may vary significantly country to country. And, and lastly, the fourth thing I say the profiler has to be aware of is that not all suspects exhibiting the characteristics are necessarily going to be terrorists. And, and therefore, um, they, they, there, there is a, a, a question mark, I think you could say, at least over inductive profiling. So in, in, in argument, I, I would say that in trying to understand what is terrorist profiling, I would suggest that if this process uh, that is uh, essentially aimed at discerning likely, character, likely terrorist characteristics so that you're predicting them, but also on the basis that that process has to, has to be generally inductive. It can't really be deductive or certainly it's not as effective as being a deductive type of profiling. So hopefully that gets us to the first question or at least part of an answer for the first question. So moving on then to my second question in the book is how should the usefulness of terrorist profiling be examined? So this is a very difficult question and it was one that I pondered for quite some time and thinking about well and it's almost where you're looking into the future and saying could there be a profiling process out there uh, that would be useful and if it was, well, how would we make that determinations? And I should say at this stage that in all of the examples I looked in the book, I haven't I haven't been able to draw any conclusion other than to say that any of the examples probably don't point to the fact that this is uh, that terrorist profiling is a useful tool uh, for policing. But I argue that in order to try to understand future manifestations of this, we need a framework to, to at least measure usefulness. And what I argue is that we need to understand the profiling process in much detail, in a very significant detail. And you'll see from the slide that the way that I view this is that it's a sequence of mini steps. And these steps aren't always in one direction. And there, there isn't a perfect process to analyze the profiling process. What I argue is that if we start to view uh, two fundamental differences, there's, there's three parts to this, but there's, the first two parts are significant first. Well, the first part looks at the construction of profiles. Uh, and secondly, we have to look at the application of profiles separately. Whereas going back to the examples that we have in the literature already, a lot of it tends to, uh, to obscure the difference between these two steps. And I argue that if we take this approach to separate construction from application, we have a much more systematic process to analyze any profiling process. At the construction stage, there, there's lots of um, different steps. It's not any one step. So we, the best way of thinking about this is that there is a sequence or series of steps here. And I refer to this first step as being an assessment of the input data. So you're looking primarily at, well, what is the data that the profile is going to be constructed from? And this part concentrates solely on that raw source that, uh, data that you're going to use for the profiles, as well as then the methods and approaches and techniques that you use in order to uh, try to extract or predict offender or likely terrorist characteristics. So at this stage, 
you you're looking at all of the available data being careful that no one data is more determinative than the other that you have a systematic process in to manage the data and also there are these various steps of verification of data so the key essence to get from this part of the process is the ability to to check on input data to avoid overlayance and sensitive characteristics to check that there is a means of how a profile at the end of this that has gone through a series of steps forwards and backwards to check the construction. And at that stage, then you get a, a profile, a constructive profile. The second stage in the process then is the application of profiles. And here at, at the application stage, I refer to this as being a, a process that where you, you're in the field and assessing an application of how uh, the, the, the profile works. So this is very much an iterative process where the law enforcement officer is going out and almost using this as a basis to be part of this testing. And again, I don't suggest this to be a perfect process, but it's at least a means to begin to understand and try to measure the, the, the ability of a profile to work in the field. The last stage or the third stage, I argue that once you're looking at the construction of profiles separately from the application of profiles, I argue that there's actually a third part to the picture. And the third part is the impact of profiling. And this, I argue, is quite an important part of the assessment that often doesn't take place in the profiling process or assessments of profiling processes. And the impact is essentially where the focus is entirely on the evidence of the wider implications of using profiling. So that I argue that there's a delicate balance between a policing tool, or in this case, terrorist profiling as, as maybe technically capable of finding likely terrorists, versus the cost of that, that, that would be associated with using that in the field. That, that there would be a point at which the cost may be too high, where the rights, fundamental rights and human rights of individuals or ethnic minorities, or racial minorities, are is too high a price to pay for the overall that that essentially compromises any sort of usefulness or potential usefulness of uh, the profile that has been constructed. So putting this together, I would say that in order, how do you measure this? It's three steps: construction, separate from application and then the impact. Now I should say as well, whenever you're going through the construction and application, you might find that that's almost like a cycle in of itself, where you have a, a construction, a, a pro profile constructed systematically by using techniques and inductive t t t uh, profiling techniques in order to have a verified profile, an application, and then that, that uh, as a result of the application, in the field, there could be some learning that is gained by the, by the police officer in the field, and that can go back through the process of construction and application again. And you might be wondering, well, what's the purpose of going through this process? Why, why do we need this three stage step? Well, the reason why I argue for that is that it helps create what I refer to as the profiling spectrum, that it helps us to understand and make judgments about various manifestations, examples of terrorist profiling. And the purpose of that is that you can draw more a more systematic approach so that you, the conclusions you draw about uh, the examples of terrorist profiling, you have a clearer basis, a more sounder basis to draw those conclusions. So the profiling spectrum, as you can see, ranges from formal to informal. So I argue that, that at, at the formal end of the spectrum is those types of terrorist profiling that might be uh, more systematic and official use of a profiling method and tend to exhibit three defining characteristics. The first one is that there will usually be an official and systematic process to construct the profile. So that, that construction profile will have a, a, a verifiable technique, such as maybe data mining, knowledge discovery processes. There are various different ones that can be used in order to ensure 
that the data and the raw source data is being managed appropriately to have a, a verified profile, a, a profile that's likely to be considered um, lawful. The second defining characteristic or formal is that, that the application of the profile by law enforcement in the field is, is checked and tested, that there isn't just a case of here's your profile and go and apply it in the field and nobody ever checks to see how, is, how does that actually work in the field or how is officers applying it in the field. So that those at the formal end will have a very clear process almost of testing that in the field. The third, third step is the ability to review um, the practices after you go through uh, construction and application, construction again, or reconstruction and reapplication, so that there's that cycle that continues in order to try to perfect the profile. At the opposite end of the spectrum are informal uh, types of profiling or manifestation. So what I argue is that that informal profiling is where there is not the same systematic process to construct or apply profiles, where you have e examples of profiling that, that, that may, they may have a, a systematic process, it's just not known about, it's not officially recognised as a profiling process, there's much more limited information about that type of profiling, and it just doesn't exhibit the same level of systematic processes in construction and application in order to uh, fit it more towards the formal end. So th this is a shifting uh, a spectrum and in order to make distinctions about different types of profile it helps to at least then have a process to, to make these value judgments. So at, at this end as I say it's clear and systematic construction of profiles with an accompanying clear application of profiling. And in the book, I, I look at different examples that are known about and different from different uses of various profiling techniques. And, and the one that I could find that was at the closest end to the formal end of the scale um, was uh, this scheme that was called the Rastafardon scheme in Germany. Now, the Rastafardon scheme uh, existed in Germany for a long number of years. I think it originates from the 1970s, but most recently it's been used after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks in order to try to find sleeper cells of terrorists in Germany. And essentially the Rastafardon scheme were called in the literature has been almost like dragnet fishing expeditions where vast arrays of personal and public information are trawled through to find suspects. And uh, this scheme became known about because there was a, a, a court case about it in Germany. So it was very helpful for me in order to try to understand, well, how did this profiling process uh, take place and in order to try to make determinations, well, how construct, how formal was the construction versus the application? And, and that was one example that I found that it uh, that, that, that used a, a more formalised approach to constructing and applying profiles. Now, the impact of it is quite significant because in order to try to classify its usefulness, it, 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 you, you also have to look at the, the impact on, on it. And in this particular case, that often these schemes involve tra trailing through vast arrays of information with very limited success, uh, or at least very limited public, publicly acknowledged success in being able to find individuals. So it's this cost factor that I, that, that I think is quite important in assessing the impact. At what point does these exercises become too burdensome on society in liberal democracies where you're, you, you're essentially snooping or allowing the state to snoop on citizens. So that, that's a major concern that overshadows any, any, ex, any application of a profiling method. The second methods that, that maybe move a little bit more closely to the informal side, and I'd say they're probably fit somewhere in the middle, were these examples from Israel where they use this pro behaviour profiling technique in when we are in airport in Israel and that provided quite a useful way to think about well how does this work in a practical sense whenever law enforcement officers are faced with threats that are in front of them and could be live and in the book I go through and assess this pr approach in Israel. Also I've looked at different examples from the US uh, such as their computer assisted passenger pre-screening systems and I also looked at their automatic targeted systems that were adopted in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. 
and ultimately I conclude that that the really the, the key problem with these is is that impact is that whilst we can never be sure in a utilitarian perspective whether they actually find or are able to like, likely to identify suspects is that even if even if they were able to find that one suspect that often the, the key concern is that the cost of these are significant on society that could cause a, a deep mistrust between police and their communities that they serve. In, in terms of then uh, that, that, that examples that move more towards the informal side, I looked at different uses of what I call low visibility police powers. So examples that I looked at were the likes of stop and search powers in England and Wales. And this is where the the, 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 where I, I was looking at essentially where police officers, whenever they're exercising the power to stop and search a suspect, or is that tantamount to a profiling process? And I argue that actually, if you think back to what we said, terrorist pro, what profiling was generally, this process that's able to make distinctions, determinations between those who are suspects and those who are likely not, not to be suspects, that so, stop and search may well actually equate to that type of, of system because if you think of the police officer who is faced with a suspect in order for them to exercise discretion as to who they stop and search that's almost a keen and tantamount to a profiling process because they're essentially using a process to identify somebody who they want to engage in enhanced screening or ask more questions about so on that basis uh, I, I argue that th this is actually a process, that, that that thinking process that begins whenever a police officer stops and searches a suspect, they're essentially making those distinctions that, that may allow this to be classified as a profiling, uh, on, on a profiling basis. And I argue that, that there's considerable evidence, I'm not suggesting that all stops and searches are, are forms of profiling, I'm just suggesting that some instances uh, in the way that the power is constructed may allow for uh, this to be considered uh, profiling or forms of profiling. And I, I classify it more on the informal side. Uh, and the reason why I do that is because if you think about the Rastafardin scheme, the behaviour profile in Israel, and you'll see in the book that they have very, very much a much more systematic process that separates construction from application Whereas in the context of stop and search powers, they, they, it may have the same level of process, but we just don't know about it. And that's the problem whenever you're making these determinations that that in order to allow for um, this to be assessed as a as a practice, we, we need to know the construction versus the application and in order to make that determination about the likely impact. So in essence, uh, that's the profiling spectrum. So ranging from formal to informal, formal having a systematic process to construct and apply and test profiles with a consideration of impact. Whereas on the opposite side, informal, not as a systematic system. There may be a systematic system, but there's just no way of determining that uh, from construction, from a, a application. Ultimately, I conclude that on the examples that I have considered in the book, now there will be other examples in time and the more information we get, this profile spectrum can be used again and again in order to draw these and to be updated. But in, in relation to the examples that I've looked at, the, the formal uh, manifestations, I argue, may have a value in society, but that, that each society has to decide whether the cost of using these is too grave in terms of its impact on society, that there comes a tipping point, the tipping point at which that in a utilitarian perspective, they might be useful to find a suspect, but the cost of finding that is greater, that suspect is greater than the individual, uh, the cost in society because of that distrust that could happen between the police and the communities that they serve. At the other side, I argue that those that move towards the informal are, are not are, are not only likely to be unlawful, they're probably going to create a means to really sow that seed of, of distrust between police and their communities and therefore are unlawful and un, un, unlikely to ever assist 
um, in finding suspects. So, so there we have the profiling a, a spectrum. So in order to, to make those determinations on a systematic basis, I argue that there are three steps in the process. One, looking at input, how data is managed and how profiles are constructed separately from how profiles are applied and used in the field. And again, the overarching impact of, of that profiling on society. And then once you have that, you're able to classify it on the profiling spectrum. And thank you so much for listening so far, but we've just one more question to work our way through. And this question is, can terrorist profiling ever be considered a useful counterterrorism tool? So that, that often leads on from uh, the last question in, in the sense that once we've put them on the profiling spectrum, uh, we, we now are able to make a much more uh, firm assessment of whether or not they're likely to be considered uh, useful. So I say, well, well, let's look at the evidence. And this is just a, a, the evidence of the, the ones that I selected in the book. It, it, there, there are going to be lots more as time goes on, the more we get to know about different examples from placing practice that allows us to make these determinations. But I essentially argue that, well, if you look at the German one, there was one potential terrorist that were identified. And I think it was was it three million different pieces of personal information and different databases that they trawled through to find that one potential terrorist, and that's that's quite a compromise between uh, find, trying to find perhaps the sleeper cell versus the so somebody's individual rights to privacy. So th there's an uneasy tension there between efficacy and fundamental rights that that casts a long shadow over the usefulness or any potential usefulness of even formal manifestations of profiling. In terms of the Israeli behaviour profiling, well, arguably it's, it's portrayed as being one of the safest airports in the world. So maybe in part that, that that's down to some of the techniques and within any sort of management security, there's going to be a range of techniques. So I don't think we could say definitively that one tool the behavioural profiling approach is necessarily going to be definitive. So again, it's a little bit inconclusive as to whether or not this could be considered evidence-based to say yes, to the, 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 it's able to ensure the safety or manage the risk associated with terrorism. And lastly, in the context of the US, many of the schemes that were started that were akin to the profiling process, many of these schemes have been abandoned or at least abandoned publicly because of that impact and the cost associated with that impact. So, and the, the, the means that through which that's happened is the defunding of pro programs. So often here you have uh, evidence from, from three, just three different examples that, that almost leads you to the conclusion that uh, it, almost an incomplete conclusion where, where I argue and say, well, there's probably another just one small piece of the jigsaw. Is it even lawful to be doing these types of examples? Are, are, are they considered to be lawful? So I, I argue on the basis of formal manifestations, there's a degree of probability here to say, yes, they probably are lawful because they have a means to ensure construction and application and a means to manage data to ensure or at least minimize the use or over-reliance on uh, sensitive characteristics. Um, of course, with the caveat, caveat that these manifestations need to be properly conducted by having demonstrable input and output, so that systematic process. But, and, and on the other side, I argue that no informal manifestations are very unlikely to ever be considered capable of assisting law enforcement. And often in these instances, uh, they're not only likely to be unlawful, they're likely to be very unhelpful to society. And in drawing those conclusions that you might say, even, even the examples that we looked at, they weren't powerful examples of, of, exa of showing how uh, good practice operated. And that's that, that's really what I did on my, on my second last slide uh, before we go for questions, is the, the formal manifestation therapy will come with a number of limitations. And it, it, in the sense that, are they really able to demonstrate capably that they can find those that are likely to be terrorists and certainly no evidence to re really suggest that in any sort of meaningful way 
and uh, the, the, the sheer quantities of personal information required for this type of profiling is, is, is a, it's concerning and some might even say alarming and cast that shadow over whether the state should even uh, be exercising this type of what's or this type of processes that are tantamount that some might say are mass living exercises. So, and I ultimately conclude that these practices may well serve to erode the democratic legitimacy of a state's moral authority to govern, that ultimately the question of using profiling as a counterterrorism tool might sound appealing from a political perspective, but from a legal perspective, the cost of that and the cost of using that may well erode that democratic legitimacy. Thank you so much for listening, and I would very happily take anybody's questions at this point. Thank you so much for that, Noel. It was incredibly interesting. Um, I sort of see, and, and the book really is focused on the whole concept of, pilot, of profiling, how it can be applied, and you have presented so many uneasy tensions in the book. Uh, I'm just curious if we didn't use profiling. Um, did you I mean, from the book, you really focus just on this question. Um, but have you thought about what other solutions could be presented in terms of intelligence gathering that might be less invasive? I mean, certainly we saw after 9-11 a whole slew of legislation being introduced to strip people of their privacy, essentially, um, in the US and in other countries that were equally concerned about the threat of that terrorism. So I'm just curious because uh, I, I think you've done an incredible job and it, but I'm like, what do we do then? You know? <laughs> That's a great well, I question. wondered if you'd had any thoughts about this, because I think profiling has always been the most traditional tool for for, you know, identifying potential threats and uh, and individuals. That's a really good question, Giovanni. So from that, I, I would say that, well, the problem is I haven't formally considered it in the book, but when in preparation of the research I have, and I think that the problem with alternatives, and I think it's natural to think, OK, this is not conclusive, conclusively in favour of even whenever we, we started the start and said, look, we, we, we probably understand profiling through the prism of ethnic profiling or racial profiling. And as, as I said, they're, they're not great examples. Of, they're naturally going to lead to the conclusion these are unlawful. But the, the problem with looking for alternatives then is, well, in, in regards to intelligence sharing, that, that, that tends to operate even in a more murky, in a, in a very almost in the shades of grey and, and, and I, I argue that the more you bring the likes of these types of examples and uses of profiling out into the light and shed more light on them the more we see maybe how ways of, of, of getting them more towards the formalized side and I ultimately argue as, as you said in the book is that yes that these types uh, there, there probably could be examples out there that that might work in practice but Ultimately, I would argue and say that, that the likes of, say, movement to intelligence and sharing of that data, that that's often even worse because you don't know about what's happening. And if you look at the, the example from Germany, where they trawl through masses of personal information in order to find uh, the likely one suspect that they had came to in, in order to identify that it wasn't even clear that they were a suspect in any event. but at least we were had, a, had an ability to be able to draw conclusions on that, whereas in the intelligence world that would almost be silent, that that would be happening in the shadows of the law. So I, I think any response to this and answer your question has to have a degree of legitimacy and that legitimacy can only come about as a consequence of bringing that uh, process, whatever the process is, out into the, out into the light. Oh, thank you for that. No, I said it, it is terribly complicated um, and, and fraught. Um, but no, yeah, I think uh, finding a transparent, formal solution um, is because it sounds like you really can't escape profiling when you're doing this type of work. And I think um, that's something for every all of us to consider. Um, I'm curious too, I mean, uh, a lot of profiling and when you talked about the formal process 
is about um, the beginning, the data collection. And, and you did mention that internationally, it's a bit of a mess. We're not collecting the same kind of data. And of course, you know, you're talking to uh, staff of, you know, UNODC. So we are focused on looking at a more international perspective. And is there anything you would like to see to, to enhance international mainstreaming of data um, so that it is easier to share. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so in, in, in regards to say trying to have a standardized process, I think it'd be good to have minimum standards uh, that are particularly focused on management of data. But but I, I, I would argue that even, even trying to develop that, that as soon as you'd have that process developed, that that is changing and the way we use data and change and exchange data is such a fast changing space that even if we were to able to crack that nut where you have the standardization across different police forces across the world that as soon as you'd be in that position of saying yes everybody's collecting the same information we have a code of practice in place that the way that that say individuals and those that are likely to be engaged in terrorism that they will have iterated their their approach and changed very easily as to how they change that data so i think that that there is a tension there too with how do we even set those minimum standards ensuring that if we're constructing profiles for an international suspect and having the same types of information available that we're comparing region to region or jurisdictions jurisdiction that that's an imper imperfect process but i think the minimum minimum focus would be having those codes but with a foresight that those codes aren't going to be the answering of themselves that you might find that different jurisdictions have to work more closely together and may have a more easier means to share information together in, in order to work and again that's an imperfect process thank you for that um i'm just opening up the floor to questions it seems that uh our participants haven't used the chat, so I'm encouraging them if they'd like to ask you something to raise their hand or to use the chat function. Um, in the meantime, too, I'm really curious what um, got you interested in the topic in the first place? What is what was the inspiration for writing this? The inspiration was it, it originally comes from research that I conducted on my own PhD. And it, it primarily what got me into it was, was the case uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, the Gillen case. And, and that was a case that concerned the use of stop and search powers. And for me, whenever I was reading the Gillen case about how suspects are being uh, stopped and searched and effectively detained in a short, in, in a very short way in order to allow stop and search to happen, that, that I found that, that, that how do we use laws in that space uh, as a means to balance security with uh, individual rights and I think for me looking at that and thinking well could that be a profiling space could that be a space where, where profiling is actually taking place uh, but, but before I got to that I took quite a bit of work on saying okay well what is profiling how does it actually exist today and hopefully the book takes that that debate a little bit further down down that road trying to understand and I'm not saying for a moment that my view is necessarily an overarching view of of the academic community it's just one view as a means to try to make this a little bit more systematic in dealing with a topic that has so many tensions in order to draw firmer conclusions oh absolutely thank you for that um let's see i see that at the moment there are no questions um I guess I will end the session. I am so grateful for you being with us. And, and I just, I found it fascinating because I do think it's so complex. It is so, there is no right, there is no wrong, but the potential to offend is enormous. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and the need to protect is also enormous. So it's it's really, a complicated but fascinating topic. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with us today. And thank you to all of those who have been here with us for the talk this afternoon. I uh, wish you all a good afternoon and thank you again, Noel. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you for listening for everybody as well. Mm -hmm.